Thing. Um, so welcome to the meetup. Uh, so we have a couple of Apache Beam committers uh, that talk a little bit about uh, Apache 2.0. Then we have uh, an uh, Apache Beam use case where one of the users kind of go through how they're using uh, Apache Beam. So our first speaker tonight is uh, Devor Onachi from, uh, from Google. He's a, an Apache Beam uh, committer, so he's going to get us started. Uh, by the way, so this, this presentation is being live streamed and it's going to be recorded. So uh, we'll probably ask people to uh, repeat the question. So with that, we'll take it, take it over to DeVore. Better? Yeah. All right. So Apache Beam is a uh, open source project for expressing both batch and streaming data processing use cases. So basically, when you use Beam, you are focusing on your logic and your data, and without letting the details of the runtime engine leak through into the code. Basically, it raises the level of abstraction uh, so that the code becomes portable. So this separation of underlying details uh, from the API allows the same Beam pipeline to run on many existing uh, data processing of them includes uh, Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Apache Apex, and Google Cloud Dataflow. Uh, so kind of if there's anything that you remember from uh, today's meetup, it's this sentence. And kind of we'll try to go over this sentence in various uh, ways and the various perspectives, but this is kind of the key point. Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. And these three key, uh, uh, three, these three things are key, unified, efficient, and portable. So uh, I'll speak just a little bit about the evolution of project and uh, how we got to this day. So. Uh, back in 2004, Google published the original MapReduce paper, and that paper fundamentally changed the way we do distributed data processing. Uh, the uh, uh, innovation at Google didn't stop there, and uh, Google kept innovating and building new, uh, new and additional cool things, and shared some of those things in, in research papers uh, with the wider community. So, kind of. Uh, the wider community had lots of things to read, but not much to play with. At the same time, the open source community uh, created its own MapReduce implementation in Apache Hadoop, and uh, an amazing ecosystem of products around it got started, uh, mostly under the umbrella of the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, and these two tracks existed uh, for a relatively long period of time, separately with some influence one over on the other. Uh, back in 2004, Google started opening its internal technology uh, to the wider world and first starting with its own cloud customers. So in 2014, Google rela uh, released Cloud Dataflow, which is a programming model and a fully managed service inside Google Cloud for uh, executing such pipelines. Uh, and Apache Beam is the next logical step in this evolution. It's a uh, move, moving of the pro uh, programming model from Cloud Dataflow into uh, a new open source project under the Apache umbrella. And in, in, in this project, kind of these two tracks merge back again. Uh, something really cool happened last week. So uh, uh, the project and Apache Software Foundation announced the availability of the first stable release of Apache Beam. And that's why uh, we are here today and that's how you know this meetup is timed. Uh, so looking back on, on the project, the project was accepted into incubation uh, back in February of 2016. And then throughout 2016, the project uh, 
was an incubation going through, you know, co-donation, uh, refactoring, uh, you know, cleaning up of dependencies and making all other things uh, Apache projects have to do. And then back in December, uh, Apache Beam graduated as a new top level project at the foundation. And then since uh, December now to May, uh, the community worked hard in building uh, this first stable release. Uh, we are denoting it as 2.0, kind of it's a continuation of previous releases where this project kind of or originated from. Uh, the first stable release really signifies uh, from the community an intention to maintain API stability, right? So uh, in many cases, you know, projects change APIs. Once you upgrade from version seven to version eight, you have to change many things. Like this is a point from the community to, to say, all right, now we have a stable API and there will be releases going forward but the community intends to maintain compatibility between those releases for the foreseeable future. Of course, sometime in the future, we will make another major release that may you know, change that, but for the foreseeable future, we will be uh, with this stable API. And kind of this is a moment where many enterprises would uh, consider uh, deploying this project in, in production. So today we'll have three talks. So I'll start uh, talking about the project in general and talking about portability and how Apache Beam integrates the back, uh, big data ecosystem. After me, we'll have Ruin, who'll talk more about deeply about uh, efficiency and you know unified concepts in the model. And then at the end, we'll finish up with a uh, very specific use case. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start with, you know, kind of, uh, after this introduction, let's start with the first talk. So I, I'm going to separate this into, into four pieces. Uh, for a little bit, I'm going to talk about Apache Beam programming model. And then I'm going to dive deep into portability. Then I'm going to show you an example of a real life pipeline with, uh, with an example of that pipeline running on many engines. And then I'm going to go back and talk about extensibility. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go to uh, a few key things that, that make Apache Beam a unique uh, uh, project. And uh, first thing to talk about is if, if we are trying to unify batch and stream processing, we, we, we need to look at uh, uh, separation between event time and processing time. So on this uh, diagram, we have some events. Events uh, represent some things that are gathered and that, ha that have happened and are coming into our system. Uh, they have happened at a certain point in time, we call that event time. And that is uh, uh, displayed on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis uh, represents time when that event came to our system. So in, in the ideal world, all events would uh, appear along this uh, diagonal line, uh, signifying that all e events came to our system immediately at the time the event happened. However, due to various effects uh, that we may or may not be able to control, like network delays, or if our users are on a mobile phone, certain events happen uh, and have different queue. So for example, this element number three, uh, got to our system approximately at the time it actually happened. And this element number nine uh, came to our system maybe seven or eight minutes later after it actually happened. So this may actually be a case where uh, maybe this was a streaming system that processes events from a mobile game. Uh, and then maybe, you know, the user was in an elevator or in a garage and then only after several minutes, uh, the network connectivity was good enough uh, for this uh, uh, data point to come to our system and then we have various delays. So kind of se separating event time from processing time will be a key difference in, being in our ability to unify batch and stream processing. Beam model focuses on four key questions. 
and separating these things into clean PIs. So the first question is, what the results are calculating? So here we are asking, are you doing some joint machine learning models, you know, histograms? This is kind of uh, your business logic. The next question is, where in event time are results calculated? So this really asks, how does the time each event originally occurred affect the results? Are results aggregated over all of time? Or they are perhaps windowed uh, in some fashion? The third question is when in processing times are results materialized? Does the time the element arrives in the system affect the behavior of the system? And finally, how do refinements relate? If we choose to emit multiple results, how those results relate to each other? And then I'm going to show you these four questions on a running example. So in this example, uh, let's assume that we are doing a, a streaming system that processes events from a mobile game. So let's say that we have users playing that game and they are divided into teams. And it's a uh, goal of our system to display a leaderboard across teams, right? So basically, each user belongs to a team, score of the team is sum of the scores of users belonging to the team, and we are looking to display a team leaderboard. So through a series of events, let's see how we can build such a, such a pipeline. So here we see kind of one line of code that takes input, applies to it a transformation, called summing integers per key and producing an output. So this line of code represents a business logic. We take an input, do something with it, and produce an output. This can be as simple as summing integers, or it can be as hard or as complicated as training machine learning models. And that is being uh, encapsulated into this composite transformation. So let's see how does this pipeline work. Now we see event time and processing time, time as before. We see a, a running line over processing time representing the, our system processing elements, encountering new events, and figuring out the sum. After all of processing time, you know, the result in this case is 51. And what we see in this specific case is a traditional batch calculation. We have all the data available, we go element by element. Once we go over all the elements, we output the result. And this is a traditional batch use case. Now let's start building towards a streaming system. So we are going to answer the second question, where in, in event time? So to, to do this, uh, we are going to window the input into fixed windows of duration of two minutes. Right? If you are going to build a streaming system, we can't look at the, all the data at once. We have to limit ourselves into looking at chunks of event time. So with this one line change to our example, we, have, we modify this pipeline to behave differently. And let's see what happens. So first, instead of having one sum of 51, our system is going to produce four results. Why? Because we have four chunks of event time if we are doing uh, fixed windows of two minutes. So instead of 51, we have 14, 22, 3, and 12, right? Similarly as before, processing time goes, we encounter new elements, but we are producing results per window, okay? This is the first step towards building a streaming system. This is not a streaming system yet. It outputs elements, uh, results, only after the entire processing time is complete. So there is no uh, real time effect yet. To get to a real streaming system, we have to teach the system when to produce the output for each window. And we do that with the concept of a trigger. With this one line code change, we are specifying a trigger and teaching a system to output results for each window when the system believes it has seen all the data for that window. And we call that, pro that concept a watermark. Trigger at watermark. Trigger 
when you believe you have seen all the data. All right, so let's see the animation in this case. So uh, watermark is uh, this green squiggly line. We have same things as before. We are producing four results for four distinct chunks of event time. So still we have you know, result from 12 to 12.02, result from 12.02 to 12.04. And then the system produces results when the green line passes the end of the window. So as the time goes on, we are producing results for the first window. After some time, we produce the results for the second window and so on. Now we do have a real streaming system. Time goes, we're processing elements. When we believe we have seen all for this window, we give you a result, right? However, of course, the, the system can't know that it has seen all the data. It can believe so. It can heuristically predict based on other elements whether we expect more elements or not. And in this diagram, we see that the system was right three times for three windows, and it was wrong once for the first window. Due to this element number uh, uh, with the value nine coming unexpectedly late. And in this case, the system produced incorrect results for the first window and produced correct results for the remaining three windows. So let's start solving this problem. Now, we do want to produce results relatively early to build a system with low latency, but sometimes the system will be wrong if we are very aggressive. And we want to build uh, knowledge into the system how to deal uh, with this. And the way to deal with this is, yes, I have produced an incomplete result for this window, and I, when I see number nine, I can correct it. So we are again going to make a one line or two line change to this running example, and we are going to specify, uh, we are going to change the triggering a little bit, and to say to the system, in addition to producing results at watermark, when you believe you have seen all the results, please produce results late when you see a new element for every late element that you see. But let's make it a little bit more complicated as well. Please produce early results as well, early speculative, incomplete results for each window after one minute. So kind of, we can build to the system, uh, we can build a system that for each window gives us incomplete results so that we can see where the result is trailing to, then the actual result we believe is going to be, and then if we are wrong, a correction, an update, a refinement at the end of the day. And then these results, multiple results per window are being, uh, they relate to each other in accumulating mode. We'll see a little bit later what does that mean. So looking back at this same diagram as before, again we see watermark in green. We see on time results every time the watermark passes the end of the window. For this uh, element number nine, we see a new result for this window, producing a result of 14, a correction, so the system was able to get out of a ba bad prediction, but in addition to that, for other windows, uh, like this one, we see a incomplete speculative result kind of where the result is trailing to, so that the system downstream can maybe take an action on, on that. And now, with this we have built a really complex streaming system. Streaming system that can deal with out of order delivery, that can deal with late data, that can, de that can predict where the results are trailing to. And we are able to do all that with one line code change. Going back here, so everything that we had to do from batch to streaming happened to be a one line change. And the key insight here is this wouldn't change no matter how simple or complicated 
your business logic is, right? It does not matter whether we are summing integers or training machine learning models. What, whatever we are doing, Apache Beam separates business logic from the environment in which your code runs. You write your code exactly once and you can run it, you know, in a classic batch mode, in a windowed batch, in streaming, in streaming plus accumulation mode, or in any scenario in between <coughs> without ever changing a single line of code along the way. And that is the power of Apache B unified model. All right, so that was a section on the unified model. Now I'll talk a little bit about portability. So Beam Vision is to mix and match SDK and execution engine. At the core of the Beam project is the Beam model, this unified model and this power that I have showed you uh, so far. That model is realized in a set of SDKs. So users use SDKs to define data processing pipelines. And as a project, we provide you a choice of them. And then those pipelines defined in those SDKs can run on multiple runners, and we provide you a choice of runners. And those runners can be on-premise or in the cloud. It can be uh, open source or not. They can be fully managed or not. They can be anything. And then finally, when the, uh, when the runner needs to go back and execute something that the user specified in a language, the runner needs to go back to the same language the user specified. And we in the project provide scalability for developers so that not every runner needs to support every SDK or every SDK, every runner. We provide clean abstractions so that uh, code written once just works on everything else. And this is uh, vision for the project. Anything run anywhere. Of course, visions are a journey. And you know, as of May 2017, uh, the vision is relatively similar to uh, what we uh, are intending it to be, but not quite. So we have a SDK in Java and Python. SDK in Java does run on all of these runners. SDK in Python runs on a subset of them. So cross-language infrastructure is in progress, but otherwise, uh, Java SDK runs on Apache Spark, on Apache Flink, on Apache Apex, on Google Cloud Airflow. We have a runner for Apache Gear Pump currently uh, being developed in the project. And then we have several runners that are currently being investigated and prioritized. So let's look at a couple of example runners. So I'm going to look at these three today. Uh, and I'm going to show you a screenshot of Beam Pipeline running on each of these uh, three runners. So first, Apache Spark, so that needs no introduction, very popular choice right now in the big data world. It really excels at uh, in-memory and interactive computation. Apache Flink is more kind of a newcomer um, to, the, uh, to the broader big, uh, big data scene. It has really clean semantics for stream processing and it's quite good. On the other hand, Google Cloud Dataflow is a fully managed service in Google Cloud for uh, data processing uh, pipelines that developed from those uh, years of work at Google that, that I have uh, talked before. But you know, before I go into that, let's talk a little bit about how do we really build an abstraction layer? If we have Apache Spark and Apache Flink or Cloud Airflow or another runner, how do we really build a, an abstraction layer that and raises, raises the level of abstraction so that anything can run on this? You know, maybe we can do an intersection of the runner functionality and you know, provide APIs for you know, some small set that exists on all of them, right? That would be way too limited. Maybe another approach would be to try to build Beam as a union of uh, a functionality of any runner, of all runners, right? This wouldn't work either. This would be more like a kitchen sink, right? And, you know, we try to frame Beam as 
at the forefront where data processing is going, both pushing the functionality or, uh, into the runner and pulling patterns out of the engine. So I have a couple of examples, right? So keyed state is an example of functionality that existed in more than one runner uh, for a while now. It did not exist in Beam until recently. And that's an example of Beam taking a pattern out, generalizing it, and providing it as a Beam API. On the other hand, you know, Beam is influencing multiple other runners uh, uh, along the way. So for example, the semantics of Flink's data streams API is heavily influenced by the Beam model. But that also means that not all runners are equal, right? So if we are really not an uh, intersection of all runners' capabilities, that means that some runners don't support everything that other runners support, right? And that's absolutely the case. And we are trying to be very upfront about this, and we are trying to categorize runner capabilities and communicate that not all runners can do the same thing. So in this example, the, the uh, screenshot may, may be a little bit out of date, maybe two or three months out of date. Uh, but kind of, we are communicating to users, if you are using uh, some set of features in Beam, you can expect that to run uh, reasonably well on a runner, o on, a, on a particular runner. And today, we have choices that, you know, batch runs everywhere. Streaming, basic streaming also runs everywhere. More complex streaming runs on a subset of runners. But in every pipeline you have, you will have at least two really good choices for every pipeline. All right. With that, let's take a peek and look at the use case. So I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of code, and I'm going to then show you screenshots of that code running on multiple runners. I'm not trying to do a live demo. Uh, I was burned once with a SSH tunneling into cloud and various Wi-Fi's and things like that, so we'll take a uh, few screenshots instead. So this is an example of a pipeline. So this is a main Java program. So this is written in Java SDK. I'm not going to demonstrate to you a word count example. I'm going to try to demonstrate to you a real example. So this is basically the, the entire code of a pipeline, not maybe entirely. So this pipeline is reading, reading text files from a set of, from input files. Then it is it's reading line by line. Then we are parsing those events uh, into more structured data. We are setting some timestamps based on the data in that line. We are doing, uh, we are uh, uh, windowing the data into fixed windows of duration of one hour. And then we are calculating team scores. So this is a relatively similar pipeline that you have seen before. So there is calculating team scores. This is our business logic. And this here is the just read, those, read the data from a text file. So this is obviously a batch pipeline. We are processing some historic data in a text file. And you know we have concept of windowing and we have our business logic here, right? So not a particularly complex pipeline. Now I'm going to look into this, our business logic inside calculate team scores. So, uh, oh actually first we look at the uh, par, uh, par, uh, parsing logic, right? So we are reading every uh, line, line by line, separating data in that line. Um, and then every time we encounter maybe a parse error, we increment a counter. Simple as that. And then uh, calculating team scores is you know, four or five line function that assigns keys uh, uh, based on the team they are in. We are summing integers per key and then doing the sum per key, right? So this is a relatively standard data processing pattern that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So let's look at how this pipeline, written once, runs on multiple runners. So I'll start with uh, Google Cloud Airflow. So this is a screenshot of, uh, of Dataflow UI, right? So Dataflow will show you uh, gra graphically how your pipeline looks exactly as you have written it. So Dataflow works hard to 
separate the execution concept and show you the data that is familiar to you in a way you have specified in the code. So if you remember looking at, at the code, the, the, U, the data flow UI really shows you text io.read, parse game event, set timestamps. These are the specific names that appear in your code. Data flow visualizes you this specific way. On the other side, we can see that this pipeline has been running for about 10 minutes and has finished. Uh, it's a batch pipeline. And you know, the screenshot is from March 10th, right? Uh, you know, the UI is interactive. So if you choose text.io and click here, you can see that this pipeline processed about 100 gigabytes of data. It's about one uh, billion elements. And it totally took like 40 minutes across all work uh, to see this data. Okay, data flow UI can also sort of uh, uh, do nice compositions. So you can package various functionalities into composite transformations, and then they can be used as a library. So like here we have seen some scores that expands into multiple libraries. And with this functionality, you can build really complex pipelines and scale to, uh, to, to complex systems relatively easily and not be bothered uh, with, with the low level underlying details. I won't go into other things on this slide, okay? So this same pipeline without a single line of, without single code change can run on Spark. And this is a screenshot of the Spark UI. Spark UI obviously looks differently, right? This is the standard Spark UI. So this pipeline runs into three stages and the Spark shows you how this pipeline executes. So it's sometimes easier to debug. We can also see that if we go down deeper into stage, in the first stage of the pipeline, we also can get text io three that existed in our code, parse game event, set timestamps, and all these things that we have seen in Dataflow UI, you know, in a different form, we can see in Spark UI. Another screenshot from the Spark UI uh, showing metrics uh, by, you know, by different uh, executors. Another screenshot of Spark UI showing kind of how much time it took for a particular task or a particular shard of input to get processed. Finally, we see some uh, timing data uh, showing um, uh, how, how much it took per machine to process uh, a given task. Now I'm going to show you the same things in Flink, right? So this is a Flink UI, again, running the same pipeline without a single code change. Again, the UI looks different. Uh, we have a pipeline, this one is in a horizontal form, all the previous ones were in a vertical form. Uh, there is data source uh, that is, uh, you know, text IO that we saw before, it's the exact same pipeline. This, this UI is not nicely shows the number of parse errors that we intentionally injected there. So they can be nicely displayed here. If we look at the amount of data processed, we see the same thing. This was run on the same input, 109 gigabytes of data, about 1 billion elements. Same, same as in other, okay? Now, I'm going to change this pipeline a little bit and make it a streaming pipeline. So as we saw before, all our business logic, of course, was hidden in this composite transform. We are going to change no more than, you know, three or four lines of code and the entire business logic runs as a streaming pipeline. This is again that power of the unified model. So we change the source from text.io to, uh, to PubSub.io. PubSub is a, another service in Google Cloud that enables sort of infinite messaging and uh, publisher subscriber type of patterns. Okay, that same pipeline uh, running in the data flow UI, nothing has changed this initial transformation change from text.io to pubsub.io, and then we see exact same pipeline and exact same result. Right, so how to get started with Beam? 
So you know, uh, our website is a is a, a nice place to start. We provide quick starts for Java SDK and Python SDK, and that's kind of the generally recommended uh, starting point. We also have two walkthroughs to explain how the pipeline works, how to build a pipeline on two specific examples, on the standard word count example and on an example of building a mobile game. So word count is a simpler one that, that is kind of a common across, uh, across engines. And the examples I have uh, shown, shown you today uh, are coming from this mobile gaming walkthrough. And then on our website you can uh, see our programming guide and uh, much more extensive documentation on uh, how to build these pipelines. All right, so this was a use case. I'm going to change gears and talk a little bit about how Apache Beam integrates the big data ecosystem and what kind of accessibility points it provides uh, to do so, right? So we talk a little bit about SDKs and runners. Right, and this is kind of, write your Python in any SDK, execute it on any runner. But this is not it. We have another four extensibility points to really integrate the big data ecosystem. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about them and how Beam can really connect different projects together. All right, so let's talk again a little bit about SDKs. So people write, uh, users write pipeline using the SDK of their choice, and we are providing multiple SDKs. We really know and understand that users uh, have pretty strong opinions about programming languages, so we really want to meet them where they are. So today we have two SDKs, uh, SDK in, in Java and Python that are fully supported and uh, complete and available in the project and the release as a uh, as part of the project right the second extensibility point is runners we already talked about it we in envision that each runner runs uh, pipelines built with any SDK today that's the case for Java SDK only but support for other SDKs is in progress so today we support four runners in the project natively. So that's Apache Apex, Apache Flink, Apache Spark, and Google Cloud Airflow. These are the four that we uh, released in this first stable release. But we have plenty of them in progress. So Apache Gear Pump is one. Uh, our Spark runner uses version 1.6, and there is a work in progress to upgrade Spark 2.0. And then we have a runner for three systems that are very similar. So uh, Apache Storm, JSTORM, and Heron that are, uh, uh, that are working together towards one runner. Right. But that's not it. Uh, when, when people evaluate Beam, one of the things that sometimes he said is, this is too complicated, this is too generic. You know, we can do simpler things. Our users don't need powerful windowing and triggering and you know, accumulation modes and different ways how uh, refinements relate to each other. Can we build something simpler? And the answer is absolutely. And we are trying to do that in a concept of a DSL. DSL is a domain specific language where we are, try, where we are envisioning that the beam will meet the users exactly where they are. So one, you can imagine one DSL being SQL, right? So instead of specifying the pipelines in Java and Python, maybe pipelines can be uh, specified as SQL queries. Or somebody can envision a XML-based uh, DSL, right? Instead of specifying Java transformations, maybe we can build an XML file that is very easy to build. It has more limited functionality, but it really makes sense for a particular community. Uh, so this is our answer kind of that this is too generic. 
it was intended to be generic, to cover anything, but also at the same time meet the users where they are. Today we have several uh, SDK uh, DSLs. The first one is a Scala DSL. It's called Shio, and it's built by Spotify. It is not part of the Beam project. It's a separate open source project outside the Beam community, but built on top of Beam. And then we have another that is currently in progress inside Beam and it's Apache Calcite. And we have several folks actively working on building SQL DSLs. And of course, there are many more options. Uh, another thing that is also in progress is a visual pipeline designer where instead of typing your code in, in Java, you can use a, a drag and drop style uh, wizard for building pipeline, and that is built as a commercial product on top of Apache Beam by a company called Talon. Right, so that was one of uh, the accessibility points. Now let's talk about libraries of transformation. Right, so in addition to DSLs, uh, we expect that Beam will have libraries. Libraries where additional functionality can be packed into. So imagine that you have a, a data, uh, data related process that is part of a bigger scenario. Maybe let's say that you are doing machine learning and then you have to prepare your data or cleanse your data before machine learning, right? It would be really nice if that can be one pipeline, one orchestrated pipeline, uh, without having to use multiple systems. And uh, packaging such logic, and such functionality into a library of transformation allows users in one nice way to orchestrate their data processing needs. And we have one such uh, library of transformations in Beam, and it's for TensorFlow. So there is a transformation in Beam that packages TensorFlow logic and we can train machine learning models in one single pipeline orchestrated from Beam and then tacked along any kind of pre or post processing that may be needed. And that can apply to any other system as well. This is the one that we currently have. Another extensibility point is towards storage systems. So in Beam, uh, we have an API towards IO connectors. IO connectors can typically be towards, you know, uh, storage systems, so file uh, storage systems or messaging systems, either for batch or streaming. So here we have many of them. Uh, you know, Kafka is a, is a particularly popular choice uh, for streaming systems and we have support for HDFS and, and many others. We also have a connector towards to uh, Hadoop input format, allowing anything that can be read in Hadoop to be read through that connector back in Beam. And then we have another set that is currently in progress. Most of these are in pull request nearing completion. And then final extensibility point is towards file systems. So if Beam is going to be really running either on premise or in the cloud, it, would, it needs to run on uh, uh, HDFS, of course, but it needs to run on Google Cloud Storage, it needs to run on S3 in AWS, and then similar offering in, in Azure, if it's really going to be performant. And we do that with a file system abstraction that really enables uh, any file system and any cloud to work natively in Beam. And you know, today we support Hadoop distributed file system, Google Cloud Storage, and through a connector with uh, Hadoop file system, S3, and Azure. So at this point I have covered most of the extensibility points. And now let's, let's wrap this up and see how this can benefit many other projects in the ecosystem. So if you have an engine, maybe you should consider connecting it with, with Beam in a form of a runner. The real benefit, you know, this will integrate together well in the Beam ecosystem, but there is a benefit for the runner author. Your engine that you have 
can now run pipelines in Java SDK, in, in, uh, in Python SDK, in Beam DSLs, in, in, in Scala. So as a runner, author, by connecting it with Beam, you open a set of communities already connected with Beam. If you want to you know, extend Beam to new languages, of course, write an SDK. But really, if I want to adapt an SDK to a target audience, be it data analysts, data scientists, uh, genomics researchers, or you know, any kind of community, really the answer is write a DSL if an existing SDK is not really suitable for that community. And by doing so, that DSL, that API can run on any runner. So instead of building a project or framing every problem as running top to bottom stack from the SDK, from the API all the way to the engine, we can basically layer the systems in a way that uh, projects really focus on something that is that they have a strength and then run anywhere or you know get users from any community. For example, if you have a component that can be part of a bigger data processing pipeline, it, it's worth considering writing it as a library of transformations in Beam. And then finally, uh, data storage or messaging system can be written as an IO connector or a file system connector. With this kind of, this is my message of this section. Apache Beam is the a glue that connects the big data systems together. It's, it's for a mutual benefit. Connecting with Beam, you either get more user communities or your user community has access to multiple engines. And that is the real benefit of Beam. Kind of looking forward, one can consider, is there a world where I have my API written somewhere in some language of choice that run in some runner and you know, Beam is just a glue that can connect them. And kind of from my personal perspective, I do see this as a success of Beam. Even if we are not in user space, even if people are not using Java SDK or Python SDK of Beam, Beam can still be a glue that connects really any API to any engine. If you'd like to learn more or get involved, of course, uh, our website is the first starting point. And then we have mailing lists, Twitter, and other activities uh, and channels uh, to get support, get help, uh, and get involved. All right, so this ends the kind of the first talk uh, on the meetup. And uh, we could do a short break or go immediately to the next talk. All right. Something not on. Okay. <coughs> 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 
domain. Uh, what happened? Oh, uh, never mind. It's just that. Good. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you very much, Davor. Is Davor, Davor's out of the room for a second. He'll be back. Um, my name is Ruven Lax. I'm a senior staff software engineer at Google. I've been at Google since about 2006, involved in our data processing. Most of that time, I've seen almost every data processing system we've had at Google. And I've been involved in these open and cloud data processing systems for the past few years as well. Is the mic off? Is the mic working? Yeah. Okay. He says the mic's working. The title of this talk is Using Apache Beam for Batch Streaming and Everything in Between. Essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the concepts that Davor hinted at in his presentation and do a slightly deeper dive. Dive in a, what these things actually mean in Beam and what they look like in the SDK and what, they, and what sorts of things they enable. So, what are some of the points of Apache Beam? Again, this is a little bit of reiteration of some of the things Davor said, but one is we want one unified API uh, that unifies uh, batch and streaming. Um, this sort of concept is getting more common nowadays, but you know, everybody remembers the old days where you would have some batch processing system, you know, Hadoop or something else, and you wanted to do stream processing. There was a completely different system. You wrote completely different code. You hope people would tend to write two versions of their pipeline, one batch, one streaming, and one both. Hope that they got the same semantics in both. Um, point of beam is we actually want this a clean separation of the data of data processing logic from runtime requirements so that was another thing that we've seen with a lot of old systems including many of the systems that we could bu we built at Google as Yelena can attest runtime requirements how many machines do I want to run this on how much memory should we give to each machine um, I'm reading from a set of files how many how many shards, how many splits should I make of that set of files to properly, uh, to properly distribute it? All of this sort of runtime logic would tend to get very, very tied up in the, in the uh, logical processing logic as well, to the point where it's almost impossible to, to pull them apart. And so you would see pipelines that like, 50% of the pipeline is just tuning flags and trying to tune like how this works or how that works just to get the pip uh, pipeline working properly. Um, as Davor just spent a, um, a number of slides talking about multiple runtime environments. So all of this started originally as w on Google Cloud Dataflow, which is Google's runtime environment. And the point of Beam was to pull this processing logic out and allow different targets for it. Spark, Apex, Flink, 
and hopefully more to come. We also want to integrate with a larger data processing system. So systems like this rarely live in a vacuum. Um, you're reading data from somewhere, you're writing data from somewhere. Often the reason why you're writing data somewhere is because you're writing it somewhere where the another tool can do further analysis or uh, further use of it. Any system like this has to integrate nicely with the, with the data processing environment, otherwise it's usually not, not of much use. So apparently we have a blank slide here. So this is the exact same quote Davor showed several times in his presentation, except I've decided to use a black background instead of a white background. I just wanted to change things up a little bit. Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed for efficient and portable data processing pipelines. So I'm going to run through these one by one, unified, efficient, and portable, and show exactly what we mean by this and how what we did in Apache Beam to uh, these claims. So going back to the Beam model. So the Beam model was, again, all about these four questions. What results are calculated? As we saw, that tends to be, you know, what aggregations am I doing? I'm doing sums, I'm doing histograms, I'm doing, you know, machine learning model trainings. What, what, what are my results calculated? Where in event time are results calculated? Where is actually a key term here? Because what we're hinting at I I when we say where in event time and not when in event time, event time is a data stream. It's actually one of the reasons why this sort of logical time processing has been very hard for people to do in the past is you tend to think of, you have an intuitive understanding of what time is and how time flows. But when uh, time is really part of your data stream and time can be all jumbled up and come out of order and you know, do all sorts of weird things, your, intu your intuition sometimes breaks down. One of the points of all these windowing and triggering and, uh, and watermarks that Davo was showing is to try to take this funky concept of event time that does not behave the way you expect it would be and put a framework around it that makes it behave a little bit closer to real time, a little bit closer to something that people are used to reasoning about. When in processing time our results materialize. Now processing time actually is real time. It's, you know, it's your wall clock time. And so here when is appropriate. And then is, as Davo was talking about, you know, when do we give results? Do we give early speculative results? You know, do we keep around waiting for late data and so on? And finally, how do refinements of results relate? This has to do with some specific modes of triggers we have. We have different ways that um, um, triggers can accumulate. You, know, you can, for like a count trigger, you can always give just the delta from the last time. So like every time you trigger, you say, here's the delta, the sum so far. You can say, or you can say accumulating and say, you, you know, keep track of it and add it up. And there's also a concept of accumulating and retracting, which I won't go into as, a, um, as none of the current beam runners uh, yet have this. So here's just you know, a few graphics of some of the stuff we have. We have classic batch. You might, these are the same animations that Davo were showing. We have batch with fixed windows. We have a concept of sessions, which I'll show in a second, which demonstrates sort of the dynamic window support we have. And finally, you know, streaming and more advanced streaming pipelines. So what is Apache Beam? This again is a bit of a repeat of, of what Davor's, uh, of Davor's final slide, um, but I think it's actually worth going over this again very quickly. There's the programming model. Um, this is the what, when, where, and how. There are the SDKs, how you actually interact with it. The current SDKs are Java and Python. Our hope is there'll be support for more language in the future. Um, there are also, not mentioned here are these DSLs. There's one popular one now called Shio, which is a, a Scala DSL on top of, on top of Beam with an API that's sort of a hybrid between a Spark-like and a Scalding-like um, API. And then a bunch of runners. 
you know, Apex, Flink, Spark, and Google Cloud Dataflow are the current supported runners. All right, back to our mantra here. Apache Beam is a unified, efficient, portable programming model. And we're going to start off by diving into what exactly we mean by this first term, unified. And I'm going to start with a sample use case that I want to solve. So I have a stream of data, of analytics data, coming from my website. And the analytics data, we're going to assume that it's all JSON encoded for now. And every record comes with a user, a user ID, a page. This is the page that this user, that this user visited, and an uh, encoded timestamp. And this is an ISO, an ISO formatted uh, timestamp in each record. And then you know this is a constant stream of, of records showing up from my um, website logs. What do I want to do with this data? I want to calculate per user session length and activity level. So what do I mean by sessions? I mean sort of a consolidated group of activity. So as you can see, assume that this line represents one specific user. User is doing nothing, nothing, nothing. And then there was a burst of activity. The user did something from, like, say, 3 to 325. And then the user went idle. This is a session. Maybe sometime down here, the user will start visiting my website again. Well, then that would be a second session for that, um, um, for that user. And one of the things we're going to show is you can actually represent this as a window type in Apache Beam, which is actually really cool and dynamic because every different key, every different user is going to have completely different windows. Many, many, sy many systems that provide windowing provide these sort of aligned windows. You can have fixed windows where you know, everybody, you know, your entire data, you have a window from 12 to 12.05. Here I can, per key, per user, I can have completely different dynamic windows. So this is a single session for this D help per user. Started from 3.04 and went to 3.25. Um, so I'm going to take this problem I want to solve and show two example applications of how I might go about solving this problem. So the first one is I have a streaming job consuming a Kafka stream. So all my website events are coming in on a, on a, on a Kafka topic. I have 10 workers processing all this data. Um, and I want to optimize to pipeline lag of a few seconds. So from the time a record shows up in Kafka, I want, you know, I want it processed through, uh, through my pipeline within, within a few seconds. And in this, I'm going to assume that there are about 2 million users a day here. But these are, all, these are all arbitrary numbers. This is a streaming pipeline. I want fresh, correct results, and I want them quickly. And I'm actually willing to pay for it. I'm willing to throw some more researches at this pipeline um, to get events, uh, to get answers you know, in a few seconds instead of a few minutes or a few hours. Well, let's look at another use case. This is the classic batch job. Use 200 workers, reading all this stuff out of, out of my HDFS archive. All these logs are also being archived to HDFS. I, I, it runs for about 30 minutes, and the input is exactly the same. I don't care about lane C here. I want the, the result, all the results come at job completion. At some level, people do care about latency for batch jobs. If your batch job starts taking many hours, people it's usually unpleasant, depending on the batch job. But you know, a minute here, a minute there, 10 minutes there, here, 10 minutes there is usually not an issue for these batch jobs. And I want to focus on batch efficiency and throughput. I want this to, I want the total cost of this job to be as low as possible. You know, if, if this job costs as much as the streaming job, why well, wouldn't I just run the streaming job and get fast output? So these are two seemingly very, very disparate use cases here. Um, so what would the user have to change in Beam to, to go from one to the other? And the answer is about 10 lines of code plus potentially a command line argument um, saying I want to run batch or streaming. So this is one of, the, one of the beauties of this Beam model is 
two things that on paper look extremely different. And when you look at them and do you think about it from the standpoint of your programming model from your actual application logic, you realize there's very little difference between the two. All the difference is, the difference is, you know, what are my sources of data and how I run it. So, let's step back for a second, and I'm gonna do a, just a very, very quick overview of a few of the abstractions in the Beam model, just so we have a common vocabulary to talk about. First, the first one is a P collection. P collection stands for parallel collection. All this is is a, is a collection potentially very large, potentially infinitely large in the case of these streaming pipelines of elements. Every element has a timestamp and elements can be in windows. Or a window is actually, yes. It, yes, sorry. So we have a question, what does parallel mean in this context? Um, P collections were originally uh, named as such because they can be processed in parallel. The whole point of the Beam programming model is to provide a pre, uh, programming model that, uh, that lends itself to efficient parallel processing. So it's somewhat a historical name um, from what, but you know, that's, that's where it comes from. The idea it is a collection, but one that can logically be processed in parallel on many different machines, unlike a standard Java collection that is processed, you know, in one process in, on one machine. Sources and readers. So a source is a special object that, that can be a root source of a P collection. So this is usually the things that, you know, the things at the top of your pipeline, although you can have many sources into a pipeline. Um, and so, you know, a source can be an HDFS text file reader, or it can be a Kafka reader, or it can be a, you know, a, you know, an EC, you know, it, it can be a, it can be any source of data. All, it produces these P collections. Every source is also responsible for producing a watermark. The watermark is the estimated low watermark of, of time, of, of timestamps. So what this means is if the source says, I believe my watermark is 12 PM, that means that the source believes I don't think I have, I will ever produce data again that's less than 12 p.m. I think all my data is, you know, that's ever gonna come through me is in the future for, from 12 p.m. Yes? So the question is, um, since this is a distributed system and the source um, is actually logically sharded, um, what is the, how is the watermark maintained? Um, this is, so the way the actual API works is if a, if a source is sharded, so let's say you have your source, you know, you have, you know, 20, part 20 partitions, uh, Kafka partitions, your source is then sharded across 20 workers. Every slice, every shard of the source uh, uh, is responsible for reporting the watermark for that shard of the source. And the runner is responsible for doing the aggregation and, you know, keeping track of the minimum of all of those. So the runner will have its, will periodically check, you know, all the, all the distributed shards of the source, see what their watermark is, effectively calculate a minimum, and have its own storage for storing that. Pardue, this is basically a flat map. It's a, it's a way for a user to write a simple function that takes an element and produces, you know, does some processing and produces zero or more elements to downstream stages. Group by key and co-group by key. This is the fundamental, uh, fundamental pri uh, primitives for uh, shuffling and grouping. So if you have a P collection of key values, after you do a group by key, you have a key collect, you have a P collection of key comma vector of values. So all the values all the distributed values, key values, which might be on many different machines, at the end you, you process it 
locally all, you know, all the values for a single key. And this is a primitive. This works together with, oh, I don't think, oh, shoot, sorry. This also works together with things like combiners for sums, which actually do this far more efficiently because you, know, you don't have to wait for all the values to be shuffled onto, onto a machine before you start calculating the sum. Side inputs, this is another key primitive. This is how we, you can take a peak collection and get a global singleton view of the peak collection and then broadcast that um, uh, to, uh, to other stages in the pipeline. Um, somewhat akin to broadcast variables in Spark, but not quite. It's a little more, it's a little more typed and structured, um, and they're, ac they're actually part of the, um, the graph in Beam. And then window is a function, so that takes an element and assigns it to one, zero or more windows. So this is actually a key thing to mention that, you know, it's very easy to start thinking of a window as some physical object. Like, a window is this box from, you know, 12 o'clock to 12.01. All a window is actually is a function. You take an element and you say, assign it an object that you call window, and you can actually assign it to multiple, uh, to, uh, to multiple windows. The window function gets to examine the elements. So this is, remember I mentioned that sessions are this example of dynamic windows because you can look at the element and say, oh, well, the, you know, this element is for, you know, some user. I want, I want this user to have this type of window. And then finally, triggers. Triggers are, as Davo was showing, a sort of kind of a way of almost flow controlling or controlling when we actually process these aggregations. So you can process windows early, you can process windows late. It's, a, it's sort of a user define control over processing. Oh, and there is one more. Uh, state and timers. This is a lower level, uh, a lower, a lower level system where instead of just doing everything with windows and aggregations, you can actually store persistent per key state um, for a given key. Um, so you, you, know, you get an element for user one, you can write something to state, you get an, another element for user one, you can read back what you wrote before and write something new. Um, and you, can, you also have timers. So you can set timers, which can be triggered off of the watermark or just off of real time. And that's effectively just a callback to say, you know, give me a ping later so I can process. Um, so you can imagine you can actually implement your own custom windowing and not use Beam's windowing entirely with this. Every time you get an element, write it to a list and state. Always set a timer at the end of each window. When the timer goes off, you know, read all the elements back and process them. So state and timers provide a lot of flexibility for use cases that don't fit cleanly into the windowing model. All right, so now that we've gone over some terminology, I'm going to step back to the code for this clickstream analysis pipeline that we were talking about before. So what are we doing here? Um, sorry. First of all, we're, we take our pipeline and we just say, read the data. And I'm explicitly just saying io.read. I'm not saying where I'm reading the data from. Um, then I'm going to apply this map elements transforms, which just takes a function that, that executes on every element. And here it's just parsing every click and and assigning it a, a key of the user. So we're getting back a peak collection, and the type of the peak collection is, is this KV type, a key value type. Now, <coughs> now that we have that, this, this set, all sessions are is just a simple windowing transform. So I apply window into sessions with gap duration of three minutes. So what I'm saying is that whenever the user goes idle for three minutes of event time, that's when I want to say the session has ended. So a, uh, a session uh, window here is going to be, you know, a three minute gap idle time on both sides with a burst of activity in the middle. I want to trigger at the watermark. So I want to trigger when I think I have all the data for the session, but I don't want to wait for, uh, for the session to be over. Especially with data dependent windows like this, it's hard to predict how long it'll be for, the, uh, for this window to be over. If some user sits out on my site for two hours constantly clicking, and I only trigger at watermark, well, it's gonna take me two hours to get any data about this user. 
So I really do want these speculative triggerings of this window here. So I say with early firings at, pin it, at period minutes of one. So every one minute, and here we're talking about wall time minutes, not event time minutes. I just want to process and say, you know, here is what I've seen so far. And then now that I've applied windowing, I say apply count per key. This count per key is under the covers a grouping operation. So there actually is a group by key hidden inside of here. And the result of this is going to be a P collection of user, uh, of user to log. And it's going to be a windowed P collection of user to log. So I'm going to have a bunch of AVs, and it's going to map every user to um, the, the number of elements in the session, and it's going to be effectively windowed. Um, now I take, now I apply, I format the sessions for output, and I apply it to, to some I.O. And then finally, I, I've now just built up my whole pipeline graph. I take my pipeline, I call run on it, and that's what actually sends it to the runner and makes sure this thing gets executed. So let's, let's start off by looking at the, at the first line. And this is going to be the, the fr uh, going into this unified model here. Well, I said we, we had two systems we wanted to build. We wanted to build a streaming system and a batch system. So streaming system. Could be a, could be getting data from from Kafka, ActiveMQ. It could just it could actually just be tailing HDFS and looking for new log files that show up and just automatically, constantly uh, putting them in there. It could actually be tailing existing files and seeing that they've grown and constantly trying to parse data out of them. In the model, when we talk about streaming, we usually Usually, we, in the model, we don't talk about streaming and batch. We talk about unbounded and bounded. Streaming and batch actually tends to be more an implementation runner thing. The key aspect here is there is no a priori bound on this P collection. It never ends. It might actually end at some point. You know, my company might go under, and then there's no more data. But you know, from the theoretical perspective, this is an un this is an unbounded input that I have to continuously process. And so if it, say if it was coming from Kafka IO, I'd actually replace this IO.read line with Kafka IO.read topic page views, and now I'm reading from Kafka IO. Well, what about the batch use case? Well, this is actually, you know, this is a bounded P collection, a common source of bounded P collection in the files. Well, I can just say text IO.read from, you know, an HD, from an HDFS location, um, and now I have a source that uh, automatically reads string, um, string new line delimited files from HDFS. So it's reading this JSON out, out of HDFS. So to, switch, so to switch between this unbounded, constantly running um, system to this bounded system where I'm just reading it all from, uh, d from yesterday's uh, directory of files, one line of code. I just have to change what my source is. You can even wrap this in a function, so you can just pass, you know, maybe pass in a boolean and say which source you want to re read it from. So now let's move on to the windowing and triggers. Now, so this is this is where we actually applied um, the sessions. So this is remember again this 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 shows data for a single user, this D helper user. There are, you know millions of other lines like this for every other user uh, in my system. This is the session we saw there. So this is event time. The session began at 3.04, went to 3.25, and you know, now I'm seeing the data, and I'm probably seeing the data with some delay, as we can see here. When I add processing time, uh, the processing time axis, this is, how, this is when the data actually showed up. Uh, and you see this is kind of interesting. Um, the first batch of data showed up pretty quickly. Then this batch of data showed up. And then these events that actually showed up that were in the middle of um, event time, the events that were happening around 310, somehow those, got, those showed up out of order. Those showed up, those showed up after these events showed up. So let's try to visualize what we're doing here. We said with early firings at period of one minute. So the first minute goes by, 
and we've now seen the first, you know, we've seen six minutes worth of the session. And we're going to out, and then the rest of my pipeline is going to output the size of that session so far and say the session went from 304 to 310. Next minute goes by. All right. Well, we have two sessions because there's a gap of more than three minutes in between. So now my system is going to say, okay, this user is has had two sessions. They did something from 304 to 310. They went idle for a while. Okay, here's a second session. Here's a second window. Then another minute goes by. This stuff comes comes in out of order. And now we merge the windows. And so this is actually part of our windowing API where you can you you can always create windows that can that know how to merge with each other. And and you can and you can say you know here's a list of windows how do they merge and in this case you know we see this stuff here we now see it's part of that session we now realize we're wrong and now we output one session from 304 to 325 um, and this is actually what the watermark will look like so this is not an ex this is not an example of late data here so this this purple stuff here this was not data that the watermark didn't know about. The watermark was actually saying, hey, the sessions might not be. If you look at the results now, you might not only get complete data, you might get sort of split up data here. And you saw here, you temporarily thought it was two sessions when it was really one. This is actually just an example of out of order data. So this, these events showed up before this event. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, um, until, the, until the triggering happens, the, the data about the session, or in fact, any type of window, fixed windows or whatnot, has to be stored somewhere. Um, it's, ru it's runner dependent. Um, generally, most runners are storing it somewhere durable. So if the pipeline crashes, um, we don't lose data. Now, there may be runners that do not. So if somebody built, say, a storm runner for Beam, Storm is usually, most, sto most Storm um, pipelines are not storing durable data. They might store it in memory. Our current runners, you know, Dataflow, Spark, Flink, are all, storing the, are all storing the data durably. In this particular case where the aggregation is actually count, you know, all they really have to store is the count so far, so you're not storing a lot of data. Um, if the user wrote a pipeline where they said, no, give me the full list of elements, then, of course, that would be more expensive. The runner we would be forced to store the full list for every key. Yes? I'm having trouble visualizing that here as a window of two sessions. Okay. So that if you have a two question that has a million elements in it, mm -hmm. and now you make it window by treating it as a window by session, it still has a million elements in it. So there are like these little gray lines between the elements that are in different. So a better way to think about it is, remember I said a window is a function. So uh, uh, think of the window as just an extra bit of metadata on every element. So every element says, I am element foo, and I'm at timestamp 12 o'clock. And for fixed windows, it might also say, I'm in window 12 to 1201 for a one minute window. So every, then when we do a grouping operation, say a group by key or count by, per key, Group by key becomes group by key and window implicitly. So all the elements that have the same window attached to it get all grouped together and processed together. So these windows may have sort of physical interpretations, like with windows, you know, there's a physical interpretation of like drawing these lines, and, it, and it's very convenient to, to think of it that way. But in practice, all it is is just an, a bit of metadata attached to every element, and knowledge of that when we do grouping operations, we can we group by that metadata in addition to everything else. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Yes, um, it's not, 
it's not in these slides, but every time, every time a window is fired, we call that one pane of the window. So if you have triggers and you fire early 10 times, you get a pane. And, the, and there is an object you can access with information about the pane. So you can say it's the first pane, it's pane number 20, it's the very last pane I'll ever see. So there is, there's some metadata you can look at to, to know the difference. In this particular case, there'll be do different windows, actually. And this is, this is actually where retractions come in. The thing I said is not yet implemented by any runner. Um, what would be, what's very useful in cases like this, because this window is actually, in a sense, unrelated to the, those two. Um, with retractions, you would take the sums you've calculated for the previous two windows, send a negative out, undo those, and then say, okay, now I've merged them together, here's the, here, uh, here's the positive. The trick about retractions is you, um, in the model, we can make retractions work through the model and through the pipeline. Your sinks have to understand retractions. So if you're, at the end of the day, if you wrote the speculative data out to a to HDFS file, and you're running in retracting mode, you better have a way of writing the undo to the file and making sure whoever's reading the file knows how to process the undo. So that's the, that's the tricky thing about retractions. Yeah, so what the watermark is saying is the watermark is a function essentially from processing time to event time. So it's, it's a clock that you can look at at any time. And the, it's telling you if the, if the watermark is 12 o'clock, but it's really like 12.15 right now, the watermark is telling you there's still some data from 12 o'clock that I think is going to show up in the system. So if you fire any windows now, you're firing them speculatively. And so when the watermark passes, it's the system's um, belief that, you know, all the data, you know, all the data that's going to be seen in the future is, you know, from b after the watermark. In this case, where do you uh, set the watermark? Like, how do you find the watermark? So the watermark will be initialized by your sources. Um, so, and every sor different sources have different ways of doing, of initializing the watermark. For instance, the Kafka source relies on the ordering in Kafka partitions, so it'll, it'll assume that each partition is ordered by timestamp, which is often a which is often a, a good assumption. And then you know across then we'll aggregate across each partition to figure out the exact watermark. Uh, for Google's pub sub system, we have a watermarker that actually peeks ahead in the unwritten pub sub stuff to sort of figure out what hasn't been seen, and then does some interpolations based off of that. Uh, each source has a different way of figuring out the watermark. So in the case of a firewall, it's batch rushing. Um, in the case of most batch runners today, just do a very simple watermark where the watermark is minus infinity, and then when you finish the whole file, they advance it to positive infinity. And since batch runners tend not to produce their output until the entire run is run, they, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to them that the watermark advances in that giant jump. Um, if you had ordering in your files, so there are systems where like log files from servers, you can assume every one file from one server is ordered, you actually can build systems that um, do watermarks off of files by tracking like, you know, thousands or millions of different files, of timestamps of files. I understand the watermark concept, but most of them aren't actually true. Yes. The question is, the question is if there's an equation for this line. No, it's a visual thing. The watermark is usually tracking the live sources and data as it sees it. So it's often a dynamic reactive thing and usually it's, so it's not based off of some equation. So there are systems that do sort of heuristic equation based watermarks. So you can take now minus 20 minutes and say that's my watermark. Um, there are, if you've ever looked at a, a lot of the streaming SQL systems that were packed in the late 90s, early 2000s, many of them work like that with their punctuations. Uh, this is actually just, in this case, we're just tracking the data. So there's no equation for that line. So assuming there's a firewall mark, it tells the level of market to um, 
yes, in the pipeline it tracks it. So as you have these shuffles and counts, it'll make sure the watermark propagates through. So you know, if you have a group by key that hasn't processed all of its data, it will hold up the watermark downstream. But it does not magically give watermarks for the sources. Every source author has to, has to write the watermark. And, and in general, there's no like, general way to calculate a watermark for a source. Most sources are different. All right, I'm going to move on. So I'll actually finish in a reasonable amount of time. Now we're, now we're on to writing output. So the other side of this you know, unified model switching here. Well, remember, we wrote this very generic, apply io.write. And, and format it. This is the other place where we will flip out things between batch and streaming usually. Also, this is, um, this is also something where uh, fault tolerant side effects are very important. Now, most of the, most of the, our current, actually I think all of our current Beam runners pr uh, have, provide exactly one semantics within the pipeline, but similar to, uh, you know, Hadoop, Spark, all these other systems, if you have side effects in your computation, those may get repeated. You know, classically with MapReduce might run backup tasks, so they might get repeated at the same time. If it fails halfway through, it'll get retried. A sync is something with a side effect. A sync is something that is writing to Kafka or it's writing to it's writing to HDFS. Um, so writing a sync usually is a little bit more thought than just writing a simple pardue in the middle of your pipeline. Um, and there's a set of guidelines for how to write a sync. Usually you want your syncs to be deterministic. Uh, so if given the same out input, they produce the same output. Item potent operations. So for instance, with a file system or storage systems like uh, big table or H space, create is, is usually idempotent. Delete is idempotent. Set is idempotent. What's not idempotent? Append. Append is usually a bad operation for a sync because if you run it twice, you append twice. Um, another technique that's often used is, is transactions or operation ideas. If you're writing to a transactional system, you can use transactions to make sure that, you know, if you've crash and, ret and, and, and retry, only one thing gets written. Some systems will let you create an operation ID and, there are, and you sort of can persist the operation ID and make sure that the retry always happens with the operation ID. So writing a sync usually requires a little bit more thought, which is actually one reason why we put I.O. in this level of would like there to be well-known I.O. connectors that people can use. Users writing their own syncs tend to invariably get them wrong and get duplicates. Writing within pipeline state, so writing you know, a pardu or a group by key, that's a lot easier to do. Um, the, um, almost, I, all of our current runners will just transparently handle the retries and the failures, never show you duplicates within the pipeline. Your count is never going to show up as seven instead of six because of a duplicate, and it just So now we're going back to the thing we started off with. We have two, these two very different looking pipelines, streaming and batch, and we said that they're actually the same pipeline in Beam, and now we actually run them, and what happens? Well, let's look at some statistics from this. Well, in this case, we had about 4.7 million early and final sessions and around 240 worker hours. This one, you had, we only had 2.1 million final It's so the triggers don't really matter much in batch, and, bat, and r since runners are free to ignore the triggers, as we'll say in a, in a few slides, batch runners usually ignore the triggers because it you know, just gives you the final output at the end. Good worker hours. Even though we're running on more workers, um, you know, the whole thing is done in 30 minutes, so we'll only have 100 worker hours. And then, a pa the, and then the Apache B model let you just write one pipeline that had, could be run in either mode with these very different characteristics different latencies, different performance characteristics, even different outputs because of the triggering, but, n uh, but you only had to write it once. Yes? Yeah, final sessions are the same. This is 4.7 4 million early and final sessions. Oh, okay, same session, just a little bit of Right. 
So this pipeline wrote a lot more, uh, wrote more output, and in fact, will continue to, because it's probably a continuous pipeline that never stops, because it's you know, writing all these speculative sessions, which you don't, usually don't need in batch. OK, so talked a little about unified. Now let's dive into efficient and say, how does a Beam enable efficient pipelines? What do you mean by efficient? Everybody wants every things to be efficient. Uh, sometimes people don't even know what they mean when they say efficient. Um, sometimes I don't know what I mean when I say efficient, and some of the engineers on my team call me on it. <laughs> They're like, what did you mean by that? <laughs> so efficiency is a runner concept, first of all. A programming model has no concept of efficiency. A programming model is all about, you know, I map element to element. I map element to window. You can, it's hard to talk about efficiency when you're talking about a programming model. Runners, you can talk about efficiency. So Beam tries to enable the runner to make things efficient. So, what, so what's an example? Reading from a source. So if, you know, something that's familiar from MapReduce, you want to read from a source, the source needs to be split some way. It's a bunch of files. So one way, so one way of doing it is let the users, uh, uh, user decide. Let the user, give the user 100 tuning parameters. They can say, read it, split it a 1,000 ways, and then they run it at small and then they start figuring out, OK, 1,000 wasn't quite right. User iterates and iterates until they finally hit on the number of splits that works for their data source. And then that works for maybe six months when their input data changes shape, and now their old configuration is now bad, and there's another cycle of trying to tune this thing. The model what we would love, we let encourage in Beam instead is the user just says, read from this source, and the runner figures out how to do so efficiently. So there's some, uh, there are some APIs that, for runners that enable that. So on source, there's a get estimated size. And, the, and there's a split method where you can, the runner can call the source and say, split yourself into a bunch of shards. Try to keep each shard around this size. The runner will give the source target size. And the source splits itself and returns a list of sources. What does this look like? Well, you're reading from HDFS logs. Um, the, runner, the runner will say, OK, we'll say, what's the size of all the files in this directory? OK, 50 terabytes. Then the runner will take 50 terabytes, maybe take in account whatever other uh, parameters, cluster utilization, quota, bandwidth, and so on. Decide that, you know what, one terabyte splits are about good for all these parameters. You get back a bunch of file names, and in fact, file chunks if there are files bigger than a terabyte, or groups of file names if there are you know, multiple files packed into a single terabyte. And that's the splitting. Sorry. Animations aren't too good to Thing with runner efficiency, well, bundling. Um, processing, at the end of the day, sending, have to do some internal bundling, even in streaming mode, doing things element by element um, rarely works very well. So a bundle is a group of elements processed and committed together. Uh, there's an API on Pardue. Um, so most people just implement process element, but really there's a start bundle, then process element is called once for every element in the bundle, and then there's a finished bundle. And this is kind of like a transaction. Everything in this bundle will be either, it will either all commit or it will all fail. So if, if you fail, you end up uh, failing an entire bundle. What's in the bundle? Very runner dependent. So streaming, streaming runners that care a lot about latency will probably give you very, very small bundles. Um, there'll be some bundling, but you're, you don't want to bundle. You don't want to wait 15 minutes to get a big bundle because then you've lost your latency. Um, classic batch runners tend to have very, very large bundles. You know, you probably can. You know, if I have two cores on a machine or four cores on a machine. I might just have two or four bundles on that machine and just try to max out every core processing one bundle at a time. Um, and this is very dependent on runners. Second thing is, the last thing I mentioned is triggers. Triggers, the triggering API the users give is um, instructions to the runner. But as we already saw with the batch runner, it's up to the runner to decide, how am I going to interpret the triggering instructions that the user gives me me. So, 
streaming, again, streaming, and not, streaming runners may try to take your trigger instructions very, very literally. You say trigger every one minute, trigger every one minute. A bash runner may decide, you know, I'm just going to ignore all your triggers because I'm a bash pipeline and I'm not really giving much of an answer until the end anyway. Pipeline workloads vary. So here's another example of where we want to enable having to do a lot. So streaming pipelines tend to vary over time. You usually have a diurnal cycle from day to day, week to week. Batch pipelines go through stages. So for the batch pipeline, you know, the yellow stage can't run until the green stage finishes because it's processing all the output from the green stage. So you tend to have like, you know, green and red are running, and then only when they're done are yellow and purple running. And the amount of processing need to be done at various stages will vary quite a bit. You know, if the green stage is a filter, the yellow stage will process a lot less. Conversely, if the green stage fans out, if it takes every word and fans it out to every letter of that word, then the yellow stage is going to process a lot more than the green stage. What people do with systems like this is they would either over-provision or under-provision. So if you over-provision, you can do every spike of your, uh, of your pipeline, though we're going back to the streaming graph here, um, you're handling the worst case, and you're paying the cost all the time because you're running as many machines as you need to handle the very worst case, which, you know, most of the day is not the worst case. Another thing people do is, is they sort of provision for the average, and they say, okay, at 9 a.m. in the morning, which is my peak, I'll fall behind, but, you know, the, my data start, starts quieting down around noon and I'll catch up and so they have a streaming pipeline that part of the day is keeping up and part of the day isn't. Neither of them tend to be great experiences. Ideally, I would actually want my workload and what I provision for to track what the current load on the system is. Um, another example, and this is a little bit more appropriate to batch, is the stress problem. So, you know, this is, a, this is a classic example in batch pipelines. Batch pipelines can't finish until all the data is processed. Some of your shards, some of your splits take longer to process than others. Uh, there are many different reasons. Time effects, you know, maybe one of these machines is just slow for some reason. Sometimes it's underlying data. You know, I, the data is, is skewed. Sometimes it's processing. Sometimes the type of data in this file ends up being more to process the type of data in another file, and that's very hard for a system to project. And the effects are cumulative per stage. That's pipeline, if you have a straggler in stage one, and then a straggler in stage two, straggler in stage three, like you're paying for the sum of all this waiting for stragglers across your entire pipeline. So what do you do? Well, I mean, historic, historically people have tried many things. Split all my files into equal, into equal sizes preemptively oversplit, split into much, much smaller chunks than I think I need, and hope that works. Detect slow workers and re-execute. So it's a classic backup problem. You know, if the worker is slow, just try to duplicate this on multiple workers and hope one of them finishes fast. Lots of papers written on how to do all sorts of different types of sampling to figure out how to do the splitting properly. The problem is none of these is a complete solution. You know, the data-dependent ones, splitting into equal sizes isn't going to help. Oversplitting has a cost that you're putting a lot more overhead in the system. Detecting slow workers, well, if it's data dependent, this, the backup worker is also going to be slow. None of these are complete solutions. What we have learned through probably 15, 15, 20 years of doing this sort of thing at Google, no amount of uphand, upfront heuristic tuning, you know, manual or automatic figuring out splits will ever guarantee good performance. Systems at scale will always eventually hit an unpredictable situation. Maybe not every day. You might run for like two weeks and then some weird data comes in and it triggers an unpredictable situation. To handle this, you need a system that can dynamically adapt to get out of a, a bad situation. So, what we did in Beam is we added, we added APIs to enable dynamic adaptation. Um, there are progress signals based off of similar ones that we've had internally at Google that let um, every source sort of, sort of tell, tell the system, you know, what fraction I've consumed so far. So if I'm reading files, what percentage of the file I've, re I've read. For streaming, the backlog, 
So I'm reading off of a Kafka topic, but I'm falling behind. And then you can tell the system, hey, I'm falling behind, and here's my backlog of unread stuff in, that, in this uh, Kafka topic. And then there's, um, for in this particular case, for bounded sources, for best, a works API that actually lets the work be stolen um, from one work to the other and dynamically split. Yes? Not all sources support all things. It turns out our Kafka source does support, does do a little bit of hackery with Kafka to make it work. But yes, an example is um, if I actually know what I am behind or not, you're just, all you're doing is reading off the fire hose. So there are, there are some sources in which you can't support it. You can imagine ways in which you can um, sort of guess if there's a backlog on a source like that. But, you know, some sources will support these things better than other. Things like files uh, do support this very well. Usually just, usually just what it means is that if you're reading from a source that cannot give good information, the dynamic, the dynamic stuff is not going to work as well as it could. So the system might make, it, the system will still work, but it might make some sub decisions from a performance standpoint. So here's an example of what we do in batch pipeline. So we have all these tasks. All of them, the green I've, represents what I've read so far in the task. The, the yellow is you know, the stuff I'm currently processing. And then you might, you might predict for every task based off of my progress so far through this task, this is when I'm going to finish the task. And so for all of these, you know, this is now, this is what I'm processing now. These are all my prediction completions. So one simple algorithm would be, let's just take the average completion time, predicted completion time, draw a line and say, I want to finish here. But I have all these you know, some of these straggler tasks that are clearly, I can already see that they're going to be straggler tasks. I'm already taking longer to process them. Well, chop them down and move them to other workers. So now you've done that, and now you've dynamically identified your straggler tasks, started chopping just those straggler tasks up instead of like the o dynamic oversplitting where you oversplit every single task in your system, hoping, to, hoping that you'll, you know, with a shotgun approach, you'll get the stragglers. And then there's still another straggler, so you do it again. So this is actually from a real pipeline that we ran on the a Google Cloud Dataflow runner. So we took a two-stage pipeline, which we split evenly, but in practice we all know even always mean even. And this is sort of a Gantt chart of the vertically was are all the tasks we're running, so many tasks, and this is sort of processing of them. There are a huge number of stragglers here. So when we get to here, you know, a large person of all our data is complete, but we're still waiting for all these stragglers to finish. When we get to here, we're still waiting for that straggler to finish, even though 99% of my data has been processed. Then we ran it again with this turning, so we had explicitly disabled this dynamic rebalancing here. We ran it again here, and you can see how much more smoothly things finished. And you can see it actually finished about 25% faster because uh, just by dynamically identifying these stragglers and like constantly splitting them and moving them across. Yeah, so that's the entire savings. This also works, ties in very well to, to auto-scaling where I can dynamically detect that the system needs more new workers and add workers. So these are workers. As I add new workers, of course, the average goes down. And now there are workers available to take these splits. So I'm going to start splitting tasks and moving them to new workers. Then I you know, add new workers, and you know, we'll keep doing that. So this actually, for batch pipelines, this dynamic work rebalancing makes auto-scaling work great. So you know, we initially start with 80 workers, then we multiple rounds of, of upsizing enabled by dynamic splitting. In the end, we have 1,000 workers, and things stayed well-balanced over those 1,000 workers, even though a bunch of tasks were already assigned before we started adding them. Um, and you, yeah, you can see how there are some long-running tasks that we like aborted to move around. Those are the, those little lines in the middle there. 
So finally, how am I doing on time? OK. Um, let, let me finish first, and then we can take some questions, because um, so I'm going to speed through this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're running very short on time, so I, I apologize. So this is, this is an example of, the, of, of portable. Um, this is it, and this is just what Davor was talking about, that we can run this on any runner, not just uh, the Dataflow runner, the Apache runner, the Flink runner, and so on. And this is actually the end of my slides. Um, yes, sorry, you had a question? Yes. Um, both of them do dynamic rebalancing, but they actually have, they mean slightly different things. So for batch, you have an estimated completion time for a task, so you, you know, you know, cut it in half and move like the rest of the file somewhere else. For streaming, your tasks last forever. So for streaming, you have long-lived tasks that actually, uh, the way we rebalance uh, key ranges. Um, so like after a group by key. So we will dynamically split and move things around. Um, but we're dynamically splitting active work, not, you know, chopping work in half. Why do you think streaming has been broken into the the different workloads and 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 the different um, do this like every second, but you could have a temporary latency hit while you're doing rebalancing. I believe, and Davar can correct me, I believe currently the only runner that implements it is the Dataflow runner, but the APIs are there love to see other runners implement it as well. So this is, this is an example of how Beam is providing APIs to runners, not just to SDKs, to enable runners to do things beyond what they do today. Yes? Watermarks are monotonic. So they they can stay still for a period of time. You know, if I'm, if I'm starting to see, a, if I see a billion elements from 12 o'clock and they keep coming in, the watermark may stay still until I progress them, but they never move backwards. This is, uh, this is why we have this issue of late data. Um, watermarks trigger activity, so it usually doesn't make sense for them to move backwards. Uh, so the, sorry, I've been forgetting to repeat the questions, but the question is if you get an event prior to a watermark, um, so the watermark is at 12 and you get an 11 o'clock event, the, how do you process it? And this is, this is what Trigger's API is all about, that you can set, you can say I want to process later, here is how I want to process it. So you have to set a specific policy for how to process these late elements. Or are we ready to? Yes. Yes. In fact, um, window all win windowing is just an API, so you can write your own window functions, session windows, fix windows. You could write that yourself. In fact, you can go look at the code for session windows and copy it and make changes to it. So. One example, I've seen people write session windows but have specific marker events that if, if I see this event, I want to, I'd never want to merge windows across this specific marker and session event. Okay, thank you very much and I think we'll move on to an actual use case using Apache. So we actually need to switch uh, laptops so we can take a, a Maybe a very short bio break, uh, get some more pizza, uh, have something to drink. Uh, but before sort of people uh, start stepping out, how many people have been using Beam? How many people are using Storm? 
uh, Spark Streaming, Apex, all the above. <laughs> okay, just trying to get a perspective. So we'll just switch speakers, and as soon as we switch, we'll, we'll get started on the, the next the next talk from Zendesk, and listen to how they're using Apache Beam.
Okay, so we'll get started with the last session uh, from Zendex, so I'll turn it over to Michael and Bo. Bo. Okay. Hi, thank you very much, Warren Works, for having us. My name is Michael Houston, and this is my colleague, Bo Fabry. We are both data engineers on the data platform team at Zendesk, and today we're going to talk about our data warehousing ETL use case with Apache Beam. So first, I'll discuss our use case and why we chose Apache Beam to solve it. Next. But we'll discuss our solution and um, share some lessons learned. And then finally, we'll wrap up with Q&A. I don't expect this talk will go the whole time, so it should be out in your, about 20 or 25 minutes. Great, so we use Beam to build the backend for Zendesk's new reporting product, Explore. And compared with the current reporting offerings that Zendesk has, Explore allows customers to view all their Zendesk product data in a single place, um, combine data from different products when doing analysis, view data with lower latency, and use new data sources. And from a technical perspective, what this meant was taking normalized production data and transforming it into denormalized reporting rows that were intuitive for customers to use and perform it for both pre-canned and ad hoc analysis. So let's talk about the goals for the reporting platform we built. First, we wanted our new backend to be extensible. Our current primary reporting system uses a Rails API in our Rails monolith. Um, while Rails is great for a lot of things, it's our belief that data warehousing isn't one of them. So <laughs> due to the difficulty of doing scalable ET on Ruby, no one's actually added any metrics to our um, reporting system in over a year, so this is clearly a problem. And we wanted our new replacement system to be a lot easier to add new metrics. And second, our system needs to be scalable. Um, Zendesk is over 100,000 customers whose sizes vary by nearly three orders of magnitude, and Zendesk needs to be able to support them all and process hundreds of terabytes of data. And third, we wanted our new system to have a lower latency. So depending on the plan type of a Zendesk customer, currently they'll see data about an hour or four hours after it's generated. And with our new system, it's our goal to have datable viewer, viewable by Zendesk users for reporting less than 10 minutes after it's generated in our production systems. So that's a big improvement. And so remember how I said that we used Rails for our current reporting system? That wasn't entirely accurate because we also have, we do, well, we do use Rails API for our primary premium reporting offering, but we also use MongoDB MapReduce jobs to power our pre-built dashboards. And unfortunately, um, we computed some of the metrics in both of these places, and this inevitably led to inconsistencies between metrics the value for a single metric in our premium reporting offering and our pre-built dashboards. And this was definitely a source of confusion for customers. 
and also in increase the cost of our current reporting system. And so in our current system, we wanted to be able to compute any metric in a single place. And lastly, um, data deletion is a requirement for every product at Zendesk. And we did not design data deletion, um, we did not design our Hadoop data processing systems with data deletion in mind. And as a result, implementing data deletion, kind of in hindsight, required a lot more developer resources and compute resources than it should have. And for this reason, we did make sure that it is easy to delete data by account ID in any part of our new system. So with that, we'll kind of dive into a high level view of our new reporting architecture. So from a 10,000 foot view, our new reporting architecture looks like this. We send our normalized um, production rows to a place where beam jobs can consume them. Our beam jobs take those normalized production rows, transform them into denormalized reporting rows, and then output as an analytics data store. Um, our analytics front end, called Bind, um, knows how to connect to the analytics data store and connect to the appropriate uh, tables for a customer. Using the Bind web UI, a customer can view pre-built dashboards as well as create their own custom dashboards and queries. So zooming in a little closer, we see that we actually have one or more beam jobs for each Zendesk product. Um, what these jobs have in common is each performs some sort of denormalization or metric calculation, and they all output reporting rows in a common format to a shared PubSub topic. This PubSub topic is consumed by a beam job that we call an ingestion job, and what the ingestion job does is it takes the reporting rows and inserts them into the correct table for a given account and reporting row type. Um, so at Zendesk, we have an application called Maxwell, which reads the database changes from the MySQL binary logs and publishes them to Kafka. And Maxwell is our primary source of data in our support product reporting job. So just so you can get a sense of what the data we are processing looks like, here is a sample JSON Maxwell object for when I created a, um, when I changed the name of a group in my dev MySQL instance from support to enterprise support. So you can see that it has the, basically the row and then some metadata about the row. So the table came from, the type, so like update or insert or delete, uh, timestamp, transaction ID, stuff like that. And if you're interested in learning more about Maxwell, it's open source, so you can check it out. The GitHub URL is there. Um, and now let's take a little bit of a closer look at our support product detail. Um, so things start off with Maxwell, which we mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, takes our database changes and publishes them to Kafka, which we then forward to Cloud PubSub. And whenever the supporting job is started, we actually want it to read the entire database history. So this way it's easy to add new metrics and correct old metrics if necessary. And for this reason, when we send the live streams of database changes to the current reporting job that is running, as well as the persister job, which saves the incoming database changes so that they can be read by future versions of the reporting job. And so as we can see here, the support job reads um, the archive database changes at startup, and then also reads the incoming database changes from PubSub on an ongoing basis. And then does the normalization and outputs the records to PubSub. Um, so now let's dig in a little bit more into exactly what the support reporting job is doing. So the short answer is it's really just doing a lot of denormalization. And for this reason, let's take an example of such a denormalization. The core object in our support model is a ticket. A ticket represents um, a series of interactions between a customer and a support team over a single question that the customer needs help with. In actuality, our denormalized ticket model depends on seven normalized inputs, but for this example, we're gonna pretend it just depends on two uh, groups and tickets. So our example, we're gonna denormalize the group name onto the ticket model, and in our example here, we have a group that's created that time one with the name dev, and then shortly after we have two tickets that come in here that are created and assigned to that group. And so what we wanna do is we wanna denormalize the group name on the ticket model and output our denormalized tickets, which are shown here by these first two rows. Uh, and then later on we see that the group names actually change from dev to eng at time 1000 sometime later on. And what we wanna do is we want to 
update the latest version of the denormalized rows with the update group name updated by these last two rows in the output table. And there are a couple interesting things here. Um, the first is we actually need to use a global window because any data about the ticket since the beginning of time could affect the output. And the second is we need to keep a state for each join. So for this example here, when the group name changed, we need to have kept the ticket rows around so that we could output the latest normalized ticket with updated group name. In a few minutes, Bo will share some of the important lessons we learned about efficient state management <coughs> with global windows. Um, so before I pass off to Bo, I'll briefly discuss on why we chose Beam. Um, the first reason we chose Beam is because we wanted to run the same code with different trade-offs. With Beam, we found that it's very easy um, to run the same code with different points along the spectrums of cost, latency of completeness. And this has helped us iterate faster, um, reduce wasted work, and minimize bugs. And Bo will share an example later on of how we're able to switch from running in streaming only mode um, to a split mode with limited code changes later in this presentation. And second, we really like that, recon that Beam recognized unordered out of data processing as the norm and future of data processing with multiple windowing strategies, tools for dealing with out of order data, and flexible triggers. We really thought that Beam provided the best model for dealing with unbounded data. And finally, it was important that we'd be able to run our Beam jobs on multiple runners. In the past, we've had trouble getting proper support for our Hadoop cluster at Zendesk, so we wanted to run our jobs on a managed runner when possible, but we also needed to be able to run, we also need to have the option to run on our own infrastructure if needed for compliance reasons. So far, we've been running on a cloud runner, um, and this has been great because we love being able to focus on the business logic of our jobs and not have to worry about scaling up configuring or upgrading it into our cluster. Um, that's it for my part of the presentation. I'll now hand off to Bo. So I have this. Hi. Uh, how do I use this thing? Nope, not like that. Like that. OK, uh, so I'm going to briefly talk about two parts of the project that I think are interesting. This is not like the whole implementation of the ETL data warehouse. Um, so the first is how we built our Beam jobs using Clojure, uh, which is a programming language other than Java or Python, or Scala. Um, and the second is how we ended up with the design that we did for the denormalization job that Michael talked about. Okay, so um, for those who don't know, Clojure is a dynamically typed functional Lisp that runs on the JVM. Who, who has even heard of Clojure? <laughs> people, that's a fair few. <laughs> um, it's known for its pervasive, immutable, persistent data structures uh, and encouraging using those generic data structures over, say, types or structs. Uh, so, like, basically use maps and lists. Don't create your own types. Um, it has good Java interop and it has lots of parentheses because it is a Lisp. Um, it's been around since... 2008, developed by, Cogn developed by Cognitect and le led by Rich Hickey. Um, if any of you haven't seen a talk by Rich Hickey, I recommend you Google it because they're really awesome. Uh, next. So we chose Clojure because as a team, we already knew it and it was what we were using and we liked it. Um, I've personally been using it at Zenness for three years, so that shouldn't be the only consideration when you choose a language for a project, but like honestly, it's a pretty big one. Uh, one of the main selling points of Clojure is its focus on a small set of immutable data structures with a large set of functions to operate on them. Uh, we think this makes Clojure a good fit for ETL, where manipulating data comes in in a generic way and is kind of the whole point. Like, I don't want my ETL system to fall over or mean to, to add a field to a class if someone adds a field to the database and it appears in, Max, in, appears in a Maxwell record because that happens every day. Um, yeah, so we think that helps with like doing data processing systems. Uh, the Beam SDK, another reason is the Beam SDK is written in Java. Clojure has really good Java interop. Uh, so Basically, I can just use the Beam SDK from Java, um, like especially when we need to. 
So, I mean, system.getM is a Java thing. I'm just calling the closure get method on it there to get a value. Um, yeah, so that's another reason. So, how do we write G Beam jobs in Clojure, and what did we create to make that happen? Uh, so, we're definitely not trying to make a full wrapper because, like, if you look at those scroll bars, Beam's really big, <laughs> and um, I don't want to write a function for every single one of those classes because it would drive me crazy and probably not be worth the time. Um, yeah. So. We've gone for a minimum viable product approach, which is we want to be able to describe and construct the pipelines using Clojure and I'll use Clojure functions as doffins, like the, in, the thing that goes into a pardo that uh, Ruben described earlier. Uh, and that's it. Everything else we'll just use the existing Java SDK um, using the interop. So for example, the windowing and triggers API, which is already like kind of its own mini DSL, we just use directly. We don't wrap it. And that is what a closure beam job looks like. Um, basically, each one of these is doing a pardo on this P collection. And this is our way of saying, uh, use this function for the pardo, uh, that's a closure var notation, and it allows it to um, get information about that function, like the file it's in and the parameters it needs, so that it can serialize that and have the workers spin up the appropriate resources and call them. On to the denormalization job. So, the denormalization job is our biggest beam job. Uh, it probably makes up 50% of the code base and like 90% of my time. Uh, I'm going to quickly run through the problems we ran into while we were creating it and how they led to the design that we have. So back to Michael's description of our problem. As he said, um, a ticket, for instance, and a group are objects that if you were to give them like a window of time for which they are important, it's like on the order of years, which is not a very useful description for a streaming system. So for all intents and purposes, if I'm joining groups to tickets, the window is global. Um, I lost my notes. Yeah, so if a group's name changes, I need to reissue every ticket, every one of these rows that I've ever issued with the updated group name. I can't like just forget about them in the past. So when I'm doing a co-group by key on those two P collections, I need to retain all of the information for all time. So our first attempt at that was we just went, well, okay, we'll just do a streaming job and we'll trigger every time there's an element come in and in global windows and we'll get the historical data in it, into it by like just firing all the historical data at the streaming job. Yeah, sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Um, so first big problem that came up is that joins multiply if you do that, if they're triggering every single time. So if a group record is updated, but not in any interesting way, like say it's updated at timestamp changed, every ticket that was ever joined to that group is like reissued with no real change. And then if there's a later join off of the output of tickets, say on account ID, every ticket for that account ID is also reissued with no real change. That's a lot of IO, so like that job didn't work. <laughs> then the uh, Beam state API came along and we think, you know, okay, maybe we can just make a little change to our streaming job and then that'll start working. And it kind of did. So we add some state to Dolphins after co-group by keys that checks whether the record coming in actually makes a change to the output, and if it doesn't, then don't issue it. And that like dramatically cut down on the I and the I/O, and it started working for a while, but it was still slow. Uh, and the reason it was still slow is because having a whole bunch of accumulating fired panes, global windows in a streaming job, and then firing all of historical data at them is just fundamentally, fundamentally not what a streaming job is meant to do and that it just keeps accruing resources as it views the historical data until it grinds to a halt. 
So we decided to run the job in two different modes, batch mode for processing historical data and streaming mode for processing incoming data. And the way we did that is we took the code base and we created a batch job, which basically was just changing a flag and changing the windowing and adding an output. So outputs all of the metrics up until the window expires, which is for a batch job is the end of the job. Outputs all of the lookups for the code group by keys for the streaming job to use later on. Very fast relative to the streaming job, which wasn't finishing. Uh, no data explosion because each code group by key only has one trigger, which is end of job. And also, as a side benefit, uh, lets us create uh, bulk load files for when we process our historical data for the output into the database instead of um, trying to uh, sort of insert each of those one at a time, which was also a thing that was starting to fall over and was neatly averted. And then the streaming job, which has the same window but discarding fired panes now, and because it has that discarding fired panes, it doesn't keep accruing state forever. And there's just a little bit of code inserted between the code group by key and the Dauphin that um, runs in streaming mode that pulls the extra lookup data and like it has some caching and stuff for when it needs to. So that took me about like, this is quite a large code base with, um, I don't know, probably six or 7,000 lines of like closure code doing the actual metric calculation. It took like me by myself just two weeks to turn it from just a streaming job into a batch plus streaming job that like is much more efficient and actually works. And all of the metric calculation stuff stayed the same, which was really cool. Uh, yeah, that just says exactly that. That's it, uh, any questions? Sorry. Uh, the learning was uh, that batch mode and streaming mode are like different and you shouldn't try and use, torture a streaming job to act for historical batch, backfills like batch mode. The other learning is that like there was no need to do that because it was quite easy to take the metric calculation code and just run it in batch mode. Um, and then also run it in streaming mode and get the best of both worlds. Yeah, and so that's actually not that big a problem for streaming mode if you're just looking at new incoming data, but we were trying to do that and take all of the existing database and fire that at the streaming job as like a, yeah. Yep. Sorry? Uh, it's really more in my code than the Beam API. So the, the Beam API allows us to construct pipelines and uh, specify pardus to do in sequence and co-group by keys and then pardus that happen after those co-group by keys. Uh, the little bit of code that I inserted in our code was the function that the pardu after a co-group by key calls. Because that, that's the point at which you have buffering state. Sorry? How do I like debugging closure? Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's certainly not a strong point. Um, a REPL is a very good tool for that. I mean, these days we do actually just use IntelliJ when we can use it as a step debugger for general closure code. But like, I'm writing closure code to run on a distributed system, so none of that shit works. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and also, we are hiring someone to help work on this. So, that link. Okay, th thank you for uh, Zendesk for coming out and kind of 
talking about their use case and how they're using Apache Beam. Thanks for the folks from Google and, and the Apache Beam uh, community coming out and uh, give us an introduction to Apache Beam and where Apache Beam 2.0 is. is. Uh, so we hope to kind of be working together in some future meetups uh, to kind of provide folks some hands-on. Um, we will be having a whole collection of meetups at the DataWorks Hadoop Summit. So I think we're having nine concurrent meetups happening uh, on the Monday of Summit, which is June 12th. So if you want to kind of check out a, a big data meetup festival uh, with nine concurrent meetups happening at the same time, uh, it's happening at the San Jose Convention Center on June 12th. So with that, we'll uh, wrap up for tonight, and thanks for coming out.